here. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the Tech Talk 2, which has been uh, organized by Derby Foundation, Mauser Electronics, along with uh, Microchip Technology. Uh, I would uh, give a special uh, welcome to the speaker, Mr. Uh, Musin from Microchip Technology. Mr. Musin is based in Bangalore, India. He leads the analog and power function group engineering team of Asia, specific uh, region at Microchip. With handful experience and expertise in power electronics and analog device, he facilitates coaches and directs microchips applications engineering team, as well as clients across Asia to design concept from scratch, uh, optimize the architecture and uh, validating design. His specialization includes complex form uh, factor converted designs, power architecture design, uh, single chain design, and uh, EMI, EMC compliance. Before joining uh, Microchip, Musin uh, worked multiple uh, power electronic companies as team lead R&D. <coughs> Excuse, sorry. Um, Musin uh, graduated in 2012 and he holds a bachelor degree in electronics and communications from Calicut University in India. Uh, today he is here uh, to talk on power up your thoughts with Microchip Analog and power management solutions. Uh, Participants, before I hand over the floor to Mr. Musin, uh, I would request everyone to mute yourself so we could take up the questions in the end of the session. Uh, over to you, Mr. Musin. Okay, thank you, Bhavani. Let me share my screen. Just confirm you once uh, you're able to see that. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I could see your screen. Okay. And my voice is also clear, right? Yeah, 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 Mr. Hussain. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for having me here today. Thank you, Bhavani, for a great and long introduction. <laughs> I should probably by heart it. So, um, a quick introduction about the topic of the day. That's power up your thoughts with microchip analog and power management solutions. So don't mistake me, I'm not going to power up your thoughts in your brain, putting a power plug, but instead what we're going to do is to discuss a few ideas and some of the latest technologies that is around power management solutions for your thoughts that is either plant or put it in an embedded system, right? Okay, so this class is going to be mainly focused towards um, or rather, I would like to call this as a discussion because we want to keep it as interactive as possible. In case if you have any questions in between, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me or put your questions in the chat box. We will answer that in the uh, towards the end of the session. Anyway, moving on, the agenda that we have for the day is um, to begin with understanding some of the challenges in modern point management designs. It is specifically why I use the word model pond management is because it's all related to today's trends or rather the trends that have started about five six, five, six years back and that's gonna continue for another five, six years. So we, there are specific challenges related to the modern designs and there are few challenges which is persistence respective of the generation. And by understanding those challenges, we will also understand ourselves that what are the solutions that we have to look at? And after that, we're gonna look through the design process by addressing those challenges. And also what are the typical design procedures that we can follow, especially while you are working on a system design and architecture level designs. And under design process, we're gonna uncover some of the technologies that microchip have technologies that uh, Microchip has invented to help you for a better designs and also some of the design calculations and examples and, and all that. We're gonna spend decent amount of time in the second bullet point. And after that, I'm gonna introduce some of the tools and ecosystem that would eventually help you to design uh, the system solutions in a much more productive way. And after that, we're gonna wrap up that. Um, this class or this uh, material is designed in such a way that it is meant for the 
moderate technical level um, uh, you know designers it's not exclusively for beginners or or to the deep level experts but it, it's going to satisfy all the uh, type of audiences here the reason why i wanted to mention that uh, is that so that your expectation is right and also we do have um, um, very wide type of um, uh, audiences here now moving on i have a very fundamental questions to all the audience probably two or three of you can unmute and answer me this what is the first thing that comes your mind comes in your mind when you hear about power management thermal thermals okay good answer efficiency thd power factor efficiency thd power factor okay all great answers so i see some of the uh, engineers are here in the audience okay so the power management is actually a very wide world depends upon what industry you work on what type of designs you work on the definition of power management varies it begins actually with from the power generation world and then transmission world and then it travels all the way down to our load sites or the node sites which are typically our um and you know, mm. where the power is getting used like the homes or factories or the um, you know anywhere the power is getting utilized and 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 once you get the power the subject uh, that deals with converting the high voltage to low voltage we call that as you know high power or high voltage power electronics world and once you convert the ac to dc okay, let me try to take my pointer yeah so once you convert the ac to dc in second stage then here it comes the um stepping down of the dc can dc to another level of dc voltages as per your system requirements and also power management is also a subject that deals with the monitoring of the power flow it could be current sensing voltage sensing or it could be both the power um, um monitoring with the very high quality elements like thds and you know the the harm the, the wide number of harmonics and also the power factors and emi emcs and all that and 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 to end where exactly the the voltage and the power is getting utilized is on the end node that's typically your embedded systems right so as i said the power management is a very higher level word that deals with multiple subject today our focus is going to be more towards the dc dc conversions as well as its power management okay um and that's where actually microchip is is um, super strong about now as i said we will first discuss what are the challenges in the power design have you seen this picture before of course all the another four or five pictures that comes in this slides is basically the symbolic pictures right we are not going to discuss about the man and elephant but what we what i mean by this is in today's world as you see in the trends of your designs probably if you are a design engineer you might have also faced a challenge that to design things in as small as possible way right the form factor needs are getting critical all the devices that you want to do it for next generation has to be the half of the size that it used to be right and the same pressure that carries to our power management devices as well now the man stands for the power management device and it need to carry a load that it was not meant to be but of course challenges are are good we're going to discuss how we solve those challenges so we call this as high power density challenge right that's the challenge number 1 you have to design something in lower form factor and 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 it's going to help in multiple designs the next challenge that we want to analyze is the noise levels right the designs are getting smarter and smarter especially the portable uh, devices or the the ones with wireless connectivity there's going to be a lot of rf in the entire system multiple of Uh, communication modules like bluetooth wifi gsm gps etc now all that is uh, are of crowded world how your power management device will react towards it and 
um, let me compare this, this cool guy who sits over here with the headset to our power management device. So the power management device shouldn't contribute anything towards the, uh, the noise spectrum or the, or the RF spectrum. And it should also not get disturbed by the, the RF noise that's around it, right? So we call this as noise and EMI issues, the electromagnetic interference issues, how we can address those things. And the very famous challenge, price versus quality, right? The price goes down, the quality never goes up, right? That has been a golden statement for all of us for all this while. But what if I tell you that we have something that improves the quality and it reduces the price for a system level? We're going to see that examples as well in the coming slides. And the last but not least, the development time or the engineering time, right? This is actually most valuable thing that gets discussed these days. There are many incidents you yourself might have seen that just before the end client demo, you see a bug in the hardware or a software, right? Despite of spending months of engineering time. So how can solutions be development friendly? How can it be also a production friendly and debug friendly, right? So these are the four pictures that I want you to recall and remember down the line of another 45 minutes, right? The man with the elephant that stands for high power density and then the noise and EMI friendly designs and also the price versus quality and engineering time. Just remember these four pictures. We're going to change the designs forever. So all these challenges, right? So as I said, the hard roads always creates the best drivers, right? This is a similar uh, African proverb. I don't know who said that, but I believe this is a very good proverb to recall at this point in time. Now, to address all these challenges, microchip is not alone in this journey. This is a timeline of acquisitions or, or the companies that microchip bought in past 10 years or 12 years. There are a few small-scale acquisitions happened in after 2018, but this timeline only shows you what microchip bought uh, with the large scale acquisition, out of which the companies like Supertex, Micral, Micro, Simi, and Netmel. If you are in the industry, you are you'll be very much familiar about these companies. All of these are today part of Microchip, and collectively, Microchip have an experience of more than sixty years and also more than four thousand different products to assist you in the power management and analog uh, solution. So microchip used to be just a digital or memory company about 10, 15 years back. That's no more the story now. And that's why I'm here today to explain you what all we can offer. Now, with all this, thanks to all these great acquisitions and also along with microchip's classic product development, today we do have a wide variety of products in analog and uh, power management um, domains. And as I said, Today, we're going to discuss mostly towards power management. Within power management, uh, we're going to specifically discussing about the DC-DC converters, and the PWM controllers, battery chargers, and power modules, right? But then that doesn't um, send you a message that that are the only things that microchip have today. Uh, no, that's not. We do have um, another wide portfolios for any power management Power, power conversions and power management solutions that deals from a few milliwatts to the kilowatts and megawatts. Okay, but, but today we're going to focus on DC DC converters. Okay, so before we talk about the solutions, let's also try to include the design process in this journey, right? First, we discussed about the challenges. Now, let's see what could be a typical design process, right? Because that matters. The first thing that we always advocate is to have a very good draft about the requirement and also incline that with the total architecture that build in the team process, right? The entire architecture design has to be done on a system level rather than just selecting device by device or component by component or card by card, right? Instead, we should have an architecture because the entire system architecture can give us a very good picture about what can be the power hungerness of your total design. And that's the only thing that can help us in terms of designing a super efficient and a very good cost-friendly power design. 
So calculating the total systems, um, I mean, the calculating the total system power requirement has to be the first step in this total journey. And then we're going to discuss about selection of the solutions and how to evaluate it, how to develop it, how to validate it, etc. Okay. Now, in the first step, there are a few points that I want you to pay attention for. Um, as I said, defining the power budget of your total system is very, very critical. In fact, that actually help you to select your source. I mean, what type of source and also what capacity of source if in the case of batteries, right? So how do we calculate the total system power? Assume that you are an engineer who is going to design a portable equipment. Let's say it's a, a, a POS machine, right? And just, just taking a rough example. In a POS machine, you have got MCUs or MPUs, the processes, and then you have got various communication interfaces, you have got a battery, you have got its power management devices, you have got a display, you have got a keyboard or a touch screen, right? So multiple things are there in the total system design. Now, how would you calculate your power budget, right? The calculation of power has to be done from the very preliminary level, but it has to be done to the, to the very fine device that you use. Again, I'm taking an example of MCU as an element in the total system design. And we're going to apply the same exercise for most of the uh, peripherals also in the same design. Okay. If you look at um, an MCU's perspective or a microcontroller's perspective, it, it's going to see, you're going to see a time that the MCU sleeps and also the time that the MCU is active, right? So it majorly varies between the sleep time as well as um, active time, and there is going to be a transition of wake up time that's going to be in nanoseconds or microseconds, right? So, depending upon the total period of time and how long the device was active and how long the device was in sleep mode, right, that actually will give you the average power. Now, in some cases, the average power will highly depend on the active current, active power consumption. But mostly in battery-based applications, it also hugely depends on the sleep current, right? So it requires a detailed analysis. And I'm going to give you some of the bullet points. You know that because of time limitations, we can't go to really the depth of um, calculations and all that. But I'm going to give you a few pointers that you could take back and use when you are designing this such system. And all these things, as I said, uh, okay, let me refresh you that. All of a sudden, we have fallen to a deep level analysis in which we have collected MCU as an example. Okay, now we're going to talk about how the MCU's uh, power uh, budgeting is done. And the same thing you can apply for any other peripherals and components as well. Okay, we have just taken MCU as an example. So we understood that there is going to be a power consumption graph like this when, the, when there's that that combined of active power as well as sleep power. Now, to do uh, all these things, you should know why this is important, right? Because this exercise actually would give you much more battery life. If you do this exercise in the very beginning of your design and architecture design, it's going to extend your battery life, or you could at least save some money in selecting a lower battery capacity. Uh, type of battery. And then, of course, this is going to help you in real estate as well as cost optimization. Because you don't have to over-design it, right? In multiple uh, design cases, we have seen that it reuses the same old power management that you used to use for different designs, right? But by analyzing it in this way, you could actually have a lot of cost optimization. And of course, the, uh, the number of devices reduces. And then when it becomes optimal, it automatically becomes much more reliable as well. And this calculation can also be used in case if you are uh, planning for the designs to be exported and to have an energy compliance and all that. Let's see how we do this. Power consumption classifications can be mainly done into two. To make it in simple words, assume that you have an MCU in your board. The MCU's power consumption can 
is 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 composed of two main element one is dynamic power consumption the other one is static power consumption if you observe the picture on your right side this is actually a cmo structure which is a very basic elementary uh, structure in any semiconductor device right and of course this that's valid for mcus as well it is all made up of a small minute um uh, thousands of small mosfets right then it's a inverting um, section that i've just taken as an example now um so you have to imagine that all the uh, exercises or all all that happens while you run a code in mcu what happens it's basically turn on and turns off certain mosfets in there right now associated to this mosfet there's going to be capacitance uh and and also in the output pins there is going to be a capacitors that we assembled externally to the mcu and there is also going to be uh, the parasitic capacitors because it's all basically mosfets and mosfets are uh, suffocated by a lot of uh, parasitic capacitors right now coming back to the dynamic power the dynamic power is the power consumption that is when the code is running when the device is in active mode so how do we get an idea of the dynamic power consumption it is basically this equation actually gives you a very good idea about what happens it's v square it's not v multiplied by 2 it's not v times 2 but instead it's v square times frequency times capacitance right so the major portion and scaling factor is basically voltage here because that's v square that means if you could select an mcu which is of lower voltage if you could select any other peripheral which is of lower voltage that's going to save some power right that's going to save some power it's not the current current level might increase right but the total power level it's going to save some and c is nothing but the capacitance in this equation if you see the c is nothing but the capacitance that's the stray capacitance or also the internal capacitance we have limited control because that's inside the ic but we have a control to look at this capacitance values while we select a device it is true for um the mosfets if you select in a power conversion design it is also true for an mcu if you select it for your control purpose right so that's another point that to be noted down and also the frequency frequency of operation is a critical factor you can't um downsize the frequency just because it increases the power consumption because some of the peripherals would need its minimum frequency to operate it on right and also it is not a wise idea to keep the frequency as down as possible because then it's going to take a lot of time to execute certain um, commands right so this was just to give you certain ideas this is not our end goal and also the the critical procedure now talking about the static power consumption it is when the mcus or any other peripherals in sleep what are the things that affects in static power consumption it is nothing but the leakage currents so the golden standard is that you have to power off everything that is not needed and you need to decide what to be done with the uh, the open pins or the unused pins right and the large layout is going to create a lot of leakage and and you also need to have a trade off with dynamic power consumption that means um the high value of capacitance will cause dynamic power to increase a lot the performance will be degraded but it's going to it's going to affect adversely in the static power consumption right and static power consumption has got majorly to do if your system design is battery based now this was just an introduction about dynamic power consumption as well as static power consumption now we're going to relate that to our practical life right all we're going to say goodbye to all the theories that we just discussed now let's focus what to be done in your board or what to be done in your daily life what we want to know is the average current consumption right that's going to give me the average power consumption so how do i get the average of this this graph i have to multiply the time versus this amplitude of this current and i need to add with the the sleep i mean the the current the down level current that's nothing but the static power or the sleep power 
So I'm going to calculate this amount of current multiplied by with the time. And then I'm going to divide that by the total time. And that's nothing but the active time as well as the power down time. That's going to give me the average one. Now, it's very easy to measure the current when the device is active or the dynamic power mode, right? Because you could just use the uh, um, you could just use the multimeter or an ammeter or a, or some high end equipments to read that. But how you are going to measure the static power? The problem is that this is going to be in nanoamps, right? When the system is in, in sleep, by large case, it, it's going to be in microamps or in nanoamps. So any techniques today that you follow or any answers to me, how you would measure nanoamps in the system design? Any quick answers? I hope you're still with me. <laughs> how would you measure nanoamps? Because we need to measure the sleep current or the current that is consumed in the sleep mode, right? No answers yet. Leave the system for a few hours and measure the remaining batteries. Yeah, so, I mean, the answer was to get the total power consumption and then reduce the dynamic power consumption, right? Yes. Yes, okay. So, how would we get the total power consumption? I mean, one way is that you will have to keep maybe a battery or keep alive and then calculate the total power consumption, keep hitting it for some time or specific duration of time. But the problem here is that you will have to design a system and then do the calculation. But here, what we want to do is measure first and then design the system, right? Because then your design iterations can be saved a lot. Anyway, good answers. Thanks for that. There is actually a very simple way to do that. And anyway, one very famous method and also the easiest method is actually there are equipments available from multiple makers too, uh, which has got the functionality to measure the nanoamps. But the ultra precise equipments are available, but that's going to be high costly. There is also a very a low cost and easy to do method. We call this as cap discharge method, in which uh, the entire system will be powered up with a capacitor in parallel. And then after some time, the source will be removed and only capacitor will be connected to the system and the system will be pushed to sleep mode. And now you know that how you, you're going to monitor that, how long it's going to take this capacitor to discharge, whether it's 100 millisecond or it's 10 millisecond. And what is the discharge level, whether it's 10 millivolt or 100 millivolt or 50 millivolt? With that discharge rate with respect to time, you're gonna, you can actually use this equation. It's a standard equation derived out of Q is equal to CV, right? DQ by DT is nothing but I. So you could get the, the current that is consumed, whether even if it is in nanoamps, you're gonna get that. Now, the only problem here is that you have to know what is the self discharge of these capacitors. But there is actually a very well um, um, procedure that is explained in microchip app not called AN1416. And all the low power design techniques and calculations and power budgeting, and also the, the capacity discharge method to calculate the nanoamps, everything is explained in a very detailed way in this microchip app not. But this is the context. You need to know the basics and the context that. Um, you're explaining, right? So this is how you calculate the power. Now that you have calculated the power, there's going to be a lot of data that is available in various data sheets and app notes that talks about different um, the different uh, peripherals and its sleep current as well as active mode current. All of this data you will have to use when you calculate the total power consumption. Now that you have calculated the total power consumption, the next is is to select the power converter devices. But even before that, you could actually get a feel about what should be your battery life, right? Because total power consumption, anyway you have, you would typically put it as a 95% efficiency and you calculate for 5% lows, and then you can get an idea of what should be the battery life, right? And 
once you have the battery life calculation, which is also explained in the same app note. As I said, I could give you a lot of pointers which you could use. So uh, in the same app note that's explained what type of chemistries of batteries that you can, you can select because uh, multiple type of the different type of chemistries of battery actually have a lot of dependency on its self discharge rate, its total lifetime, its charging current rates and discharging currents and all that, right? But um, on a general, the point that I wanted to bring in is that once you have the total power that is calculated, you could easily use the MAH equation, right? MAH is nothing but the milliamps multiplied by the hours. So how many hours you want to have the backup for the system? You could actually calculate that. Now, if the system is gonna run on a, a AC line adapter, then you can actually say what type of adapter that you want to use, whether it's a fly back converter, whether it's a, a low cost um, a cab drop kind of a converters and all that, right? So the power budget calculation is an important step in the design. Now, second design procedure that we want to look at is to select your devices and solution and also to select the eval boards and all that. <clears throat> and, and what is that microchip have here? And this is where um, actually microchip have larger role to play to help your designs. So there are three major power conversions and power management devices we're gonna discuss today. <clears throat> one is the most simplest one that's LDOs and then battery chargers and switching converters. Okay, and this is where we're gonna exactly power it up. First one is LDO. Um, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with LDO. Uh, for those who are new about LDOs, LDO is basically the simplest power converting element that it operates in a linear mode. It's majority of the LDOs are three pin or five pin device. You give input and take output. The only problem is that the power dissipation is gonna be um, high with respect to the input and output voltage differences, right? So it's not a super efficient converter solution, but it is of course a cost friendly and development friendly and easy to use design. It is highly recommended for the conversions which are uh, less than 100 milliamps and 200 milliamps kind of current levels. Of course, in the DC DC mode. <laughs> now, with microchip. Today, we are industry leaders with the better efficient and rugged and the noise performance LDOs. As I said, LDOs itself are not super efficient, but what do we mean by better efficient LDO is basically the one with lower QSEN current. QSEN current is nothing but the current consumed by the device itself to operate, right? We are using LDO to power up some certain other devices, but the LDO itself will consume a certain amount of current. If it is super low, that is the best LDO that you can get, right? So microchip have got a really cool um, low IQ as well as low dropout uh, voltage LDOs. We do also, or probably we are the industry leaders in rugged LDOs. Why is rugged LDOs needed? If it is a battery-based applications, you will have to use some uh, transient protectors and all that. But with using microchip LDOs, you could actually have... Uh, very high voltage um, uh, input capability, not for the operation operating uh, uh, ranges, but at least to withstand uh, the high voltages. Similarly about the noise performances as well. We do have some cool um, LDUs, which is kind of acts as ripple rejectors or the noise rejectors because it has got an inbuilt um, uh, second order filters, okay? So the rugged one is gonna really save some of your engineering time, right? Do you recall the challenges that we discussed about, right? And these kind, this all these four pictures is gonna pop up in all these uh, upcoming slides, right? Because we're gonna relate that challenges to the solutions and we're gonna see is that really addressing the challenges, right? Now, the ruggedness as well as the uh, lower IQ, all that will actually help in having less engineering time because you don't have to spend in a lot of time in um, selecting the protection devices and also um, you know, evaluating and getting certified and all that. Microchip automatically gives these uh, high voltage withstanding capability by uh, incorporating in the data sheet itself. Now, um, a few examples over here. For some reasons, yeah, okay. A few examples over here, MCP1810 is the industry's best lowest IQ device. 
it comes with 20 nanograms of kissing currents and um, uh, the, this one is 50 times better than some of the uh, very common low IQ LDOs out there in the market, right? Because just to give you an example, the idea is not to memorize the part number or anything, but just to give you what exactly we're doing. And similarly, there are ripple blockers. As I said, mostly in the system design, you will have an architecture like this, where the DC-DC converter gives the output. And just before the sensitive load, you need to have an LDO. Now, if you use this special type ripple blocker LDOs, then you're going to get rid of all this DC-DC converter-based noises, right? Because DC-DC converters, of, of course, um, the switching regulators, okay, that's actually the appropriate name. The switching regulator is going to have definitely the switching noises. It's harmonics and subharmonics and all that. All that needs to be eliminated properly. So the best way to do that is to use an LDO with a ripple blocking feature inside. So that's actually a patented approach by microchip. One of the example is MIC94300. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So this relates to the noise removal, right? Even if your associated circuitry is of having a lot of noise around that, the system design will keep, or this device will keep the entire system noise free. Similarly, we're going to explore the battery charges. <clears throat> Why is battery charging as a separate power converter needed? Right? That's the fundamental question. The reason why we need it as a separate device is because the device should be intelligent enough to assist the battery in all the time, whether it's overcharging, overheating, or with respect to mechanical abusing, we can't do anything electronically, but of course you could have some pressure sensors and all that. But apart from that, it is easy to protect mechanically itself. But otherwise, the battery charger ICs not only convert the voltages and current, but also it keep it in such a way that it is it's giving what needed by the battery to work in a healthy mode. For the battery to work in a healthy mode, it requires two modes of charging. One is constant current. The other one is constant voltage. And there are also other soft modes such as tricklings and all that. Uh, we're going to discuss that in, in the coming slides. But not only the CC and CV mode, it also, if there are, if there is an overheating, then the battery charger should understand it and it should cut off the battery charger. And also, if there is an overcharging, like for some reason, if there is a lot of voltage comes to the battery, then it should cut off that, right? So for all that protections, we need to have the special power converters to do the battery charging. Now, what does that microchip got in this space? We do have <coughs> special linear chargers uh, that takes care of the battery charging profiles. And also, it, it is so simple to design. Of course, it's linear chargers. Um, it is, you know, what it needs is maximum a few uh, passives and, and just an input voltage so that the battery charger is getting some power, right? We do have a certain family of devices. Let's understand what are its advantages and disadvantages. First of all, it doesn't emit any noise. And also, it is well resistant to accept any noise. So there is no EMI issues. Then PCB design is very simpler because it is just the six pin device and what it all needs is few passives around it. And of course, this is gonna be lowest cost option because um, it's a single chip solution. And um, we do have a lot of numerous orderable options. In order to eliminate your more passives to set its operating point, we could actually, microchip actually have uh, the devices based on the, pad, the part numbers, right? It, with respect to the last few uh, numbers in the total the, the part number, we could actually define what should be the operating voltage, threshold voltage and all that, right? So this device contributes largely to have the ease of development or reducing the development time and also reducing the noise, right? Because it, is, it does not have any uh, EMIs to be eliminate, eliminated because it's not a switching converter, right? Moving on, yeah, of course, another point is the price versus quality. Because this has got a very tight state machine running in that, the quality is never compromised. And also the price is less because you do not need to have a lot of passives around it. You do not need to have a lot of inductors and capacitors and all that around it, right? So, of course, it keeps us the price down and the quality up. These are the um, 
portfolio just for your future reference we do have multiple options for single cell double cell you know multiple cells and all that and also we do have classifications based on the uh, chemistries of what chemistry of battery that you use <clears throat> Moving on to the switching converter, we're going to spend a little bit of more time in the switching converter. The switching begins, right? So in case if, if you were not focusing or if you have lost your focus for some time, please come back and, and have a breath, a, a, a deep breath, because we're going to discuss something very serious here and it's going to change your design knowledge as well as the design steps in, in the coming days. Now, so far, what we have discussed in the solutions wise is basically the LDOs and battery chargers. All of them was just the linear regulators. It's all basically single chip solutions. Now, both of them are not super efficient, right? The efficiency depends on its input and output voltages. So the switching converters was invented, which does not depend on what is the operating condition. Irrespective of that, it would always maintain 96 to 90 can or minimum 90 percentage kind of efficiency for your power converter. And this is true for almost all the type of switching converters. Of course, it's trade-offs are available. Now, what happens in switching converters, basically it will have a cycle which charges the magnetics to store the energy, and it will have a second cycle which discharges the stored energy so that the average voltage could be adjusted, right? And based on its positioning of the power switches like the transistors of MOSFET and the diodes and the inductors, you could create buck converters, boost converter, which steps down or up or it does both, right? So we do have multiple type of converters. There are typical applications examples also are provided in the uh, slides just for the better understanding. Now, we do have wide varieties of such solutions as well, depending upon the power capabilities, the flexibilities, you know, the easiness of design, the complexities of uh, power rails that you need. We do have majorly converters, as a, the controllers based solutions where microchip device is only the small one where you see the pointer. The rest of the ones are the external MOSFETs, inductors and all that. The advantage is that it is highly flexible. This solution can be used for hundreds of watts. Right, but of course you need to have external devices and much more passives and the form factor is gonna be a little higher. Then it's upgraded version is the regulators where these many of such passives has gone inside. We call that as regulators. And it's upgraded version is module where almost everything is gone inside. You don't even need these passives here. This is just given to give you some flexibility. Otherwise, you can just give input and take output, just like an LDO. But in modules case, it's going to be super efficient, low EMI, and small solutions for even for higher amps. And PMIX are a special type of um, a power switching regulators, which is meant for uh, powering up the MPUs. Okay. Moving on, let's look at. So I just introduced the various type of solutions that's available and it's up to our system that what type of solutions that we need to select. But the point here is that microchip always believes on a three axis innovation in order to address the challenges as well as to improve the solutions in this particular domain. We keep inventing new IPs, we keep improving our packaging technology and also we spend a lot of investment and time on the silicon process. That's basically uh, the one that we do in the day level, right? There are a lot of technologies to be discussed. I'm going to pick and choose the one which would make sense a lot in today's discussion, that is hyperspeed control. Hyperspeed control is actually a control mode technique within microchip DC-DC converters. Not all of them, but 75% of them have the hyperspeed control uh, mode. But before that, I have a question to you is that, uh, what are the major differences that you see from board number one to board number two? The red one to green one. Can a few of you unmute and, and ensure that you are with me? Okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get that answer. What was that? It's a plug and play. There's no wires. There's a yeah, pluggable interface. Okay, a yeah, pluggable interface. Yeah, then the interface is different. Any other? And what if I what if I say you that these two designs, two boards were made for same same specification. Both of them you could consider it as a 48 volt input, 12 volt output, five amps. Okay. 
now you can think of what what are the major differences the magnetics have been uh, embedded magnetics have been embedded great answer the inductor is now changed here that's great less, answer less number of components of course, less answer. number of components that's great answer compact yeah all great answers thanks for that okay so i'm going to explore a technique here which would eventually help you to transform your board if it is in this size to its smaller size right okay of course i am not going to give you any tips to change the color that is, has to be by your pcb guys but what i'm going to discuss a topic here is that it will eventually help you to reduce its form factor kick off a lot of passives and reduce the passives values or reduce the capacitance and inductors that we need around right now in order to understand that technique or the hyperspeed control we need to know what is the conventional control or what is something that is not hyperspeed control there are multiple way to control the total converter i've just taken an example of buck converter here where the input is given there are switches then inductors capacitors and then the feedback loops comes into picture which is actually the engine that defines the characters of this the complete converter right the feedback in the feedback typically there is an amplifier if there is an amplifier then you need to have a lot of compensation circuit and then it gives the feedback to the pwm engine and the pwm engine decide what to be i mean when to turn on and when to turn off the primary mosfet which is actually controlling the energy transfer from input side to output side right so the whole thing depends upon the feedback loop here right because this is the guy who is going to come and tell the pwm engine that hey there is a change in the output you have to react now and if this entire communication loop is slow then you need to have bulk capacitors at the output right because you can't wait for the entire system to react by taking too much of time now this too much of time is actually within double quotes that that's actually depend upon the what type of system you have now here to take an example we do have an error amplifier and error amplifier works on the order of microseconds right and it's going to put in a lot of delays and also it need to always wait what happens after this r delay and there is going to be some parasitic capacitance rc delays and all that so for all that reasons this loop is slow and you need to have bulk capacitors so that even if some large load comes in all of a sudden the capacitors will act as energy storage the same case for a slightly advanced controlled mode technique the current mode technique here the difference is that the current is also the inductor current the il is also taken it as a feedback over here here in this case also we do have an error amplifier for that reason this is a slower loop but of course it is much more better than the previous control mode that we discussed and all of these converters and we do have wide varieties of its multiple variants in the industry and all of them needs a complex frequency analysis its stability checks border plot analysis and all that in order to check whether the system is running properly or not right and when it comes to microchip method you do not need all that things and and top of that it's going to be it's going to be much more simpler so what is microchip method the first thing in microchip method what it does is it kick off the amplifier and replaces the entire thing with the comparator okay in comparator what happens is the time is improved a lot it is at least 100 times is what uh, the uh, compared to amplifiers right it works in the order of nanoseconds so whatever happens in the output it immediately gets to the pwm engine this is basically an elaborated a uh, drawing of pwm engine in earlier diagram i just showed it as a uh, as a square box right so the pwm engine get the response immediately and the comparator to transfer that immediately and because of that reason you do not need output capacitors i mean of course you need for some but then you do not need the high value for capacitor and also now this entire speed is increased so the speed is increased then you could actually reduce i mean you could do a system design with much more higher frequency of operation that means you could actually reduce the size of this inductor to a larger extent and on top of that it doesn't depend on any clock that set by the user instead it depends upon what happens in the input and output right it doesn't depend on so the advantage is that it doesn't wait for any clock cycle to come to react right 
in any other converter it wait for next clock cycle to come then only the executions will be done but here it doesn't depend on all that so what are the advantages it saves a lot of engineering time you don't have to do the frequency analysis you don't have to do the broader plot analysis it's all time based analysis what you have to do and there are a lot of development boards and the other things that's available in the um and with the microchip devices as well the price versus quality quality is improved a lot because now its response time is improved a lot the price is of course it's going to come down on a, not on the device level because it 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 has got the uh, advanced control modes and all that but on a system level the price is going to reduce a lot right so these are the main challenges that this control mode can actually uh, help us on and of course the hyper speed control is with much more higher speed and much more higher accuracy and it's going to help you in the uh, total system design in a better way and what is um, another technology that we relate too much is on the copper pillar technology in copper pillar technology it's actually a packaging technology right so far we discussed about the ip i mean that what makes our system design totally different now what we're going to discuss is what makes our device totally different <clears throat> so the conventional way <clears throat> is to this is actually a zoomed in picture of an ic where inside the ic only 40 or 50 percentage actually the the uh, actual die is or sometimes it's 30 20 percentage rest of the places are its cavities and wire bonding and all that now to get from the main action area that's the die to the external pins of the ic in conventional methods they use is wire bonding but in microchip all the high power devices uses a technology called as copper pillars something like this now we do have our competitors or other fronts in the industry suppliers also uses the similar technologies but our copper copper pillar technology is actually a patented one because it eliminates the skin effect by using a very different materials and it's all uh, arrangements and all that and this makes our ic's to handle much higher currents in the circuit designs right so that makes microchips uh, high power converters a uh, very unique right and this contributes largely to the power density challenge that we just discussed in the beginning right i hope you recall that okay so there are a lot of devices and examples for your future references once you have this slides and recordings this is just to give you a few part numbers and its operating points and you know uh, the frequencies and all that similarly the other um, the one with internal regulators the previous table was actually on the external regulators uh, on the external mosfets we call it as controllers and the other one is internal regulators <clears throat> of course we also support with um, eval boards with the proper user gate and, and also the field engineer supports and all that <clears throat> we do have the uh, similarly the boost converters as well uh, that operates on and the advantage of boost converters is i mean the difference that we made is it starts up at very low voltages right because typically it is based on the uh, it used along with the batteries batteries can um, discharge to very low extents so we do have these specifically uh, designed for such battery based applications and we call this as a, a, um a uh, special boost converters because it is made for the battery based applications and it has also got interesting features like a programmable under voltage lockouts and all that because we don't want our battery to be deeply discharged because just because our power converter is still alive right so we could we could actually program the under voltage lockouts we could set the output voltage and the input uh, current levels and all that based on what we need and we do have the volt option starting from 5 volt and all the way to 40 volt just with the internal fit regulators and we do have multiple other options for the external fit regulators as well and the boost all these converters that we just discussed where we have been able to successfully use these designs or the solutions is in all these markets i typically don't uh, get into um, the details of the end markets that we sell but uh, this is just for a reference again i mean it has been very successful in such designs and out of that at least three or four devices are um are are in india itself <clears throat> okay now we do have various uh, other converters also embedded in this uh, in this presentation material but i'm going to skip some of them because it's a um, um, continuation to that and i'm going to talk about little bit about the 
modules here because the modules is going to ease your life a lot. <clears throat> The modules is, as I said, in, in all the previous discussion, we discussed about so many things which requires its own power electronics design skill, PCB layout and skills, and also stress and validations and all that. The module is something is that microchip does everything for you and just give it as a package to one, right? Of course, it's going to be costly, but it's going to help you a lot. What is inside a module? It has got the controllers, MOSFET, the inductors, the resistors, the capacitors, and and also the diodes, right? Everything is put together inside in the same chip and we call this as module. And this also largely helps us to have the high power density, right? A single chip can do all the job and also it delivers a lot of power as well. <clears throat> this is our portfolio. We do have supporting from 400 milliamps all the way to 14 amps with the capability of up to 70 volts. The Y-axis is basically the... Um, <clears throat> the voltage and the excess is the current. <clears throat> we do have uh, uh, thermal benchmarking, much better compared to our competitors of the similar modules in the market. We have all these reports are available. Similarly, this also comes with EMI certification. I mean, we did, we do our EMI certifications in our internal um, third parties. I mean, that's where internally tied up with and we get this certification done. And when we give you these modules, it, comes with the EMI certifications, right? So I hope you remember all this challenge that we spoke about, keeping it EMI free, keeping it a noise free, right? And this can actually help a lot of designs which needs uh, EMI certifications and which needs a high efficient design. And also in case if your design um, does not have too much of development time to be done the discrete level designs, then modules can be a best options. And in, in later, you could actually kick off the module and do your own discrete designs. But if the development time is tight, there could be a lot of cases where time to market and time to money is highly, highly critical. So in those cases, the modules can be very well used. <clears throat> okay, so this is about the uh, devices. Now, the last section that I want to discuss is the um, ecosystem and tools. We discussed so much about the devices and solutions. And the, the last one uh, that we wanted to discuss in the design process is basically uh, simulating our designs as well as validating your designs and how microchip can help you to do that. So we do have a tool chain and ecosystem to help you. Let me explain that in, in, a, in a little more detailed way. The first thing that we've got is a tool for the selection of the devices. We call this as tree link, which is available in the, in the tree link website. I'm going to talk about that. And then we will analyze what is design analyzer and then our simulation platform. And also we're going to talk about some of the check services. Okay. So the tree link, as I said, it's a product selection tool, which is basically available on this particular um, a web link, you could, once you get this uh, material, you could click on this, this has got a hyperlink and it will take you to the tree link. Or you can also simply Google microchip tree link, you're gonna get the, this page. The advantage of this product selection tool is basically it's a title based streaming, right? Let me take you through an example so that you will be able to understand it in a very easy way. Assume that I wanna select an, an, uh, a DC-DC converter or an LDO, which converts 12 volt to 3.3 volt with 100 milliamps, okay? So then in this, I'm not going to click on the amplifier because that's not what I want. I'm not going to click on the temperature system because that's not that I want. I'm gonna click on the DC-DC converter. Clicking that will take me to the converters page. Out of that, there are buck converters, boost converters, the modules that we just discussed, and this entire vertical is for the linear regulators. And what I need is 12 volt converter, so anything um, to that range, assume that I wanted to have a five volt converter. I could actually click on 12 volt converter also because if anything is capable of 12 volt, then it is automatically capable of handling five volt, right? It is just a matter of how optimized your design is. Now in this example, I want to select a 12 volt one Then I'm going to click on this tab and it take me to 12 volt to 16 volt input LDOs. That means these are the LDOs which are capable of accepting 
zero volt to 12 volt and there are also some LDOs which is capable of accepting zero volt to 60 volt okay it is never just in between 12 volt and 60 volt okay and the other uh, parameter that i wanted to check is on the 100 milliamps so what i have is 80 milliampere and after that what i have is 150 milliampere section here 150 milliampere is cool because i will have a 50 milliamps excuse me <coughs> 50 milliamps buffer for me right I'm going to click on this MCP1754 because it says here high PSRR. That means it is noise free. I mean, power supply rejection ratio is very good. If I click on this, it takes me to the product brief and its, its features and its internal block diagram. And there will be another link in the same page where it, it will take you to the product page where you will get the app notes, the data sheets, development boards, and all the other documents related to that, right? So this is a handy product selection tool. Now assume that once the product is selected, next is to run through MAT. I hope you're already mad by listening to me for one hour, but this MAT is slightly different. It is, stands for Microchip Analog Designer. What it, what it has is, once you click on this link, it will ask you to select what are you going to design. Then if I select power management, I'm gonna get this, this window, right? So even this MAD also will help you to select the device and solution, but MAD will actually help you to do the analysis one step ahead, okay? It's um, it's like you key in the parameters and assume that I have just keyed in these parameters and it's gonna take me, it's, it's a web tool, okay? So it's gonna load. Once I click on the enter, then it's gonna load and it will give you the, all the possible solutions for the specifications that I just clicked on. And once I click on, assume that I've just selected this MIC22, MSC23250 based solution, then I could either click on simulate or I could click on view and modify. Assume that I just clicked on view and modify, then it take it would take me to another page where it detail the analysis, what are the values, and I could lively change these parameters and the passes around it, and I can see what are the changes that will happen to the output conditions and also the switching frequencies and all that. And I just have to click on the analyze the small button here. There is also another tab here, which will show you what are the power dissipations, right? And hence you could calculate the thermals and all that. Now, instead of doing all that, assume that you as a designer, you want to simulate that in a very detailed way, right? Then what you just have to do is click on the export and you're gonna get a, or you're gonna get a file which is which can be opened in a software called as MPLAB Mindy. Now it's the time to discuss about Mindy. What is Mindy? Mindy is basically a software tool where you could actually design your ideas. It is very similar to Spices, right? The, the P Spice, Relative Spices, and all that. It's a very detailed software tool. Um, you could actually do the simulations and you could catch the bugs and you could analyze the waveform it has got all the type of analysis like dc analysis ac analysis transient noise you know all all the monte carlo analysis and whatnot it, it's like you have a super specialty lab in your laptop screen right so you could you could do all that simulations and it's a, a totally freeware the capabilities as that uh, up to 140 nodes it's a freeware right if you and most of the power supplies and analog simulations doesn't go more than that and on top of that, micro, once you install the MPLAB Mindy, you will get a lot of inherently saved files, which is basically more than 160 uh, application schematics and it has got more than 80, it is actually today 85 different proprietary device models. And every quarter we update the MPLAB Mindy, right? And there is no local installation needed. Um, even if you're on flight, you could actually run the software. Nobody does that in flight, but what I mean is that there is no internet connection required to run Mindy. You could do all the analysis in an offline model as well. And this is actually, the theoretically, it is 50 times higher speed than the SPICE simulators because this depends on a method called uh, piecewise linear modeling. <clears throat> in fact, Mindy has got two platforms. It is actually two softwares inside a same GUI, two platforms, basically symmetrics and simplest. Symbolis is used for the power supply uh, simulations and, and Symmetrix is used for the analog simulations like OPAMS and all that. <clears throat> okay, so that's about the simulation software. 
you download it go through it and if you have any issues there are a lot of training videos on youtube a lot of training materials available in the web link as well and um, you could actually it's a, again a handy uh, software tool if you face any difficulties um, you're always welcome to discuss <clears throat> the the last but not least that i want to discuss is the power check service it is purely a manual service that microchip uh, provides in the design check service, what you basically do is uh, create a microchip account and log in and submit your design files like schematics and layout and all that. Microchip engineering team, that's my team as well as the internal team, will go through the entire system design and uh, will get you the feedbacks, right? So no tool is as good as uh, multiple eyes, right? So that's for that reason we have the power check services, the manual services as well. Right, so <clears throat> this is about the ecosystem in a very brief words. If you have any questions, I would encourage you to ask that. <clears throat> Moving on to summary, I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you had some new informations as well. And um, this will be beneficial for you to uh, take up in your designs. Um, um, as, as a summary note that I wanted to bring in is that please don't depend on uh, one says that fits all the designs, right? I mean, we have seen most of the time, we tend to use the power supply designs, which is proven or which is something that we have been using from years, right? Maybe the entire system might have changed. Still, we will use the same old LDOs and uh, DC DC converters and all that. <clears throat> Instead, we would recommend you to optimize the system design. You could eventually save a lot of cost, a lot of um, <clears throat> time and, and, and also the form factors and all that. Uh, the entire microchip team will assist you to do that. And always start early on the analog and power management system designs. Please don't wait for the entire system to get the development and then get then search for what has to be the switching regulators and all that. Instead, either you design or involve microchips engagement team, the client engagement team, in order to help you in assisting the system designs. <clears throat> and also um, implement a system approach what is the system approach irrespective or instead of looking at the devices and components look at it in the block diagram way then you will have a better idea and understanding where you could optimize and today microchip have got the um, very wide portfolio that not only the power and analog uh, devices but also anything a to z products that deals with whether it's a high voltage interfaces or the um, high current drivers or the output interfaces or whether it's a, a communication modules or security devices or the the most intelligent devices in the devices like microcontrollers processor fpgas and all that so uh, think of it in a system level have a system level architecture and then try to optimize the power management devices right um, Okay, so, so these are all the a few um, last points that I wanted to highlight. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that brings me to end of this session. I would welcome the questions. I see some of them in the chat box. Uh, thank you, Musim. Thank you so much for your uh, amazing uh, presentation. Uh, so I request the participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, directly uh, raise it to Mr. Musim. It was in a, a brilliant presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. One question I have: You have uh, modules as well as um, option to de uh, design it uh, using discrete, right? So, what is the trade-off? I mean, I, I definitely understand the cost part of it, yeah. but uh, uh, where should a designer focus on module approach versus designing their own uh, chips? I mean, uh, their own uh, power management solution. Right. Get your question. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful question. <clears throat> so. Uh, it's the, um, you know, you could consider it as a debate between modules as well as anything that is not a module. Anything that is not a module, of course, we do have a lot of options. For an, Just for an example, I'm just taking a regulator, which is again discrete, but it is close to module compared to rest of the solutions. <clears throat> so here, other than the cost, um, there are a lot of advantages that module carries. <laughs> One is that, this is inheritedly, it is 
uh, EMI certified. Or that means it doesn't emit any noises. Also, it is not susceptible to the noise. It, it will not become very easy victim of noises which is around your other embedded systems or other things, other you know, around your entire board, whether it could be RF or it could be conducting noise or radiated noises and all that. So the noise part is the another beautiful advantage and why most of our customers prefer modules. And on top of that, the other advantage is that um, uh, take an example where you have to develop a system in three months or four months. And you have a lot of things to do on a firmware level or an MPU level, coding level and, so and all that. So your team will have a lot of headache towards hardware developing that. Now for power conversion, that's a different domain and you will have to spend equal amount of time in order to develop the power converters. By having modules, you could eliminate all that things. You could just use it as a plugin module, give input and take output. So the engineering time is reduced a lot, but you would end up in paying maybe another 50% uh, extra, 60% extra in terms of cost. But then once the development settles and your time to market has been successfully done, after that you could, when you have the time, you could kick off the module and you could use the regulators, right? So it's basically, you know, it's kind of um, uh, the easiest comparison is that the complete discrete is put it in the single chip and we call it as module. So these are the uh, major trade-offs. There could be a lot of other advantages as well. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, got it. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's a text Thank you. Uh, Mr. Musin, we have another question uh, from Hassan uh, saying that is this chips are effect of uh, the chip crisis and are this chip on the market? Okay. So chip prices is affected for everything, everything including whatever I have presented, whatever I have not presented, whether it's from microchip, whether it's from non-microchip. And uh, the crisis is because mainly because of the way of a shortage. I mean, all the semiconductor companies would depending on the wafer supplies. That's the suppliers to us, right? But, <clears throat> so the shortage is of course, that is there. <clears throat> but then um, what microchip did differently to address such situations is basically, we created a lot of um, uh, priority plans or you know customer friendly uh, priority plans where we could plan the uh, demand and availability in advance and get that ready much advance even before our customer needs it. So our entire ecosystem runs on based on a lot of forecasting, a lot of calculations and plannings and all that. So we have no habit of uh, come back and saying you on a fine day that, hey, sir, there is nothing available today, right? We don't do that. We will commit what is available. And there are a lot of um, other ecosystems also we have developed. <clears throat> For example, there is a... Um, uh, microchips online purchase website called as microchip direct um, you could google it and get the link where you could actually search what is available and what is not available and the other way we encounter this situation is basically to have <clears throat> uh, the neighborhood parts okay most of our dc dc converters or the modules also uh, there are a lot of pin to pin varieties available in the same families right so if one is not available we will have a backup option but we would recommend you to work closely with the client engagement team from microchip and microchips distribution partners. Um, Mauser is one of them, Mauser is here, uh, I mean, one of the coordinator for this entire session. So <clears throat> you could work with them and ensure that things are not falling apart. <clears throat> Hope that answered the question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mosin. Uh, so participants, do we have any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Mustain. Thank you so much for being up. Sorry, I was just again uh, getting unmuted myself. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mussein, and thank you, uh, Mauser Electronics and uh, Microchip Technology for being a part of this uh, Tech Talk too. Uh, so I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the session and uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I wish you all a uh, advance, a happy Diwali and a safe Diwali. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avinash. Thank you so much for uh, supporting us. Welcome.
Thanks, Muslim.